Whether it's the regular season or the off season, we have you covered as we give you the best Tennessee Titans and NFL news and insight that a fan could ask for. You're watching the Titan Upload Network. Ah, the Power Hours on the air, live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, X, and Twitch. I'm your host, Michael Bishop, and as always, thank you for joining us on this fine Monday evening. We are not even a full month away from the month of April, and it is already draft talk heating up. We will be getting to the NFL draft very, very soon. So get ready for a slew of mock drafts, get ready for a slew of trade discussions, get ready for a slew of everything, because I'm telling you right now, guys, it's going to get busy before we get done with this thing. But I promise you, we at the Titan Upload Network are crossing the T's and dotting the I's as this mock draft rolls around. So I promise you, we got great content for you right around the corner. But of course, I can't do this by myself. Of course, I've got to bring in my right-hand man and my best friend of the show, Tyler Staggs of Titans Time Podcast. Tyler, happy Monday. Happy Monday to you too, buddy. Hope uh, you had a great Easter and hope everyone in the chat had a great Easter. Uh, got to spend time with, you know, their family, friends, and, you know, just remember what the day is truly about. But I'm glad to be here talking Titans with you. And like you said, not only a couple more weeks till the draft. Things are heating up, so... Excited to talk about that as well. So, I mean, let's just be real for a minute, Tyler, before we hit our big topic of the night. You know, trades are definitely becoming a big issue, especially with Minnesota sitting with two number one picks. It's either going to go between them trading with Arizona, Minnesota. I mean, maybe even New England from what we've heard. I do think that's going to be the key component there, especially for what the Titans are trying to accomplish Mainly, let's just say Joe Alt is a big piece of that puzzle. So a lot depends on that. It does. I mean, it's going to be interesting as we get closer and closer to the draft because it definitely seems like the Vikings want to trade up to make sure they get their guy. Question is, who is that trade-up partner going to be? You know, are you going to have some fan bases that maybe aren't so happy. I mean, you mentioned like the Cardinals, how, uh, you know, the Vikings maybe look to trade up with them and the Cardinals are thinking, hey, two first round picks. But, you know, Cardinals fans, I think they have their heart set on uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. So <laughs> be interesting to see how the chips fall there and if Joe Walt does in fact fall into the Titans' lap. But that's being one of the topics we talk about, especially with the first pick. But of course, Tyler, there's other picks too. And mainly the biggest question is, who's pick 38 going to be? And as we roll through the draft profiles, we pick random players that we think would fit what the Titans are looking for, especially in terms of need and dire need. It's that. So let's not waste any more time and jump into our player discussion tonight. Let's do it. Jumping into it, I'm Michael Bishop of The Power. Joining us, as always, Tyler Staggs. Let's jump into our first segment right now. And once again, we bring up draft profiles to bring up players that we feel are going to fill needs for the Titans, especially not only just filling those needs, but guys that we feel bring an athletic prowess, bring that little edge that the Titans are going to be needing, especially when it comes to players you're trying to get rejuvenated on certain spots of this team that really desperately need help. So Tyler, this week, I think edge rusher is a big piece right here. So Chris Braswell to me just fills a massive need that I think the Titans really aren't thinking about right now. Yeah. You know, it, 
and it's kind of funny because you see a lot of these uh, national media people talk about, you know, since we're talking about an edge rusher here, they're like, Titans may take an edge rusher there at seven with uh, Turner. And I'm like, mm, out of all their needs, while edge could be up there in needs, I could see you know, that second round pick, pick 38, being a spot where they maybe address that if the right guy falls there. And like you said, Chris Broswell could be that guy. So, and, you know, edge rusher. We have Harold Landry on one side. We know that we have Arden Key on the other side as well. And nothing against Arden Key. I love the energy that he brings but is he going to be a guy that is just, you know, situational that you throw out there? Or are you going to want to throw him out there for every down? I mean, think about it. how many times we see Harold Landry come off the field between if, whether it's a three and out or the whole defensive drive. He's usually always out there. So we need another guy that we can put opposite of Harold Landry that can take on the majority of that. Don't think that's going to be Rashad Weaver. Again, nothing against Rashad Weaver, but edge becomes a position of need at that point. And as you said, Arden Key, you know, I think he f he does a good job for what he is. He's mm -hmm. just not that dynamic game changer. And the one thing I look at Broswell's game that really just intrigues me the most is he's disruptive. Mm -hmm. He knows how to get in and just mess things up, especially when the offense is trying to run the ball or if it's a short screen or if they're just trying to just do a little trickery, so to say. That intrigues me, especially with how he can get down the field, how he's able to fight off some of these offensive linemen that just outweigh him by about at least 40 or 50 pounds. And he's so elusive, Tyler. I mean, what is it that makes this guy so intriguing that the Titans would be willing to put their reputation on this young man at pick 38? I think one of the things that makes him very intriguing is the, the fact of how quick his burst is coming off the line. I mean, that that's one of those things that you look at that, you need, especially in your edge rushers, you want them to be able to get off that line quick and get on the tackles quick or, you know, potentially around the tackles quick because, as you mentioned, that can be disruptive. That can throw things out of rhythm. And, you know, he's he's got a great rush approach uh, and has many different ways that he can attack you. Now, yes, he... He does have his weaknesses, but those positives right there could be enough to, you know, intrigue teams like the Titans there in the second round, early in the second round, to take a shot on him and add him to that defensive front. And my next point, and Ariel Carter brings this up, which is kind of funny. So thank you, Ariel, for reading my mind. Mm -hmm. Darius Robinson is very much a guy that I am looking at as well at the edge position. And I honestly, I think he might be one of the best edge rushers that would probably be a day two fit. I just don't see him falling to pick 38, but I mean, Tyler, I mean, is that debatable at that point? Do you feel that might be, maybe that Robinson could potentially slip through the cracks and maybe give the Titans another option to look at other than Braswell? Yeah, definitely. Um, like you mentioned, Robinson, he he has that potential to be, you know, one of those top edge rushers in this draft. And like you mentioned, he there's a good chance that he's gone before thirty eight. But if he somehow does fall to thirty eight, then Rand and Coach Callie have to sit up there in the war room and decide, like, okay. Which one of these guys do we think will be the better fit for what we're looking for defensively here and getting after the quarterback? 
So it definitely becomes a discussion then of which guy do you take if you're looking at edge. Now, of course, I look at some other prospects here, especially with what Broswell's game brings to the table. But I do have to look at the weaknesses as well, Tyler. And I mean, one thing that does seem a little concerning, while his injury history is clean, let's just be honest, the dude doesn't get into trouble injury-wise at all. But that's also because he really hasn't played that much, you know, in a starting role except for last year. And granted, you know, being right behind Will Anderson, you're not going to <laughs> see a lot of action. Hey. However, though, that lack of experience, you know, is that a little concerning for a guy that's basically going to be coming into the NFL, you know, just a little green? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of ways to look at it there. You can look at it as him coming in green, not having as much of that experience um, there. And, you know, going back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, that could be one of those things where if Robinson falls to 38, and the Titans are looking for an edge rusher, they go with the guy that's not as green, you know, maybe not taking as much of a chance. So you do have to factor that in, but at the same time, a way that you can look at it is this is a guy, while from the experience standpoint, may be a little green, he also doesn't have as much wear and tear on his, on his body. So could that be maybe a little bit of beneficial thing coming in at that point? So Tyler, I mean, how would you grade this pick right here if the Titans went through and added that amazing young playmaker that could have a high upside, especially with a young, talented defensive line to work with? Do you think that might be enough to make a little bit of a dent in this defense long term in terms of just skill set. Yeah, I I think that it would you know you're able to add a guy that if this is the route the Titans decide to take, how I would grade it is I would grade it as them continuing to add a athletic guy to this defensive front, a guy with a, a good motor that can get after the quarterback and it's adding more pieces to that front. You know, we've seen it in the past. If anything, just from a depth standpoint with edge rushers, like doesn't hurt to have more of them. So I think Broswell's a guy that, you mentioned his lack of injury history. He could be a guy that comes in if you take him, be a solid piece that, you know, is out there a lot for you. Maybe don't have to worry about the injury bug as much as with someone else. And if I was, you know, if I were to put a letter grade on it, like edge rusher for me isn't as high up as some other positions. So if the Titans took Broswell at 38, I'd probably give it, you know, a B, B minus, something like that. Uh, probably lean more towards the B just because of the athleticism and the potential that he would bring to being on that other side opposite of Harold Landry. And a good point you bringing up the letter grade. So I want to give everybody in the chat as well a chance to chime in on this. If the Titans go through with a Chris Broswell pick at 38, what would you give this grade on a scale A to F? Go ahead right now. We'll read them off as you get in that information to us. So, Tyler, you've given your grade, you've given your take, and we've talked about the weaknesses. But let's talk about this in terms of just what we understand, what we're trying to build. I have to take it at this point, you're competing against three very talented quarterbacks in this division, and I need some help. Big Jeff can't do it on his own. Mm -hmm. You know, Harold Landry can't do it on his own. So while we talked about Trevondre Sweat last week as a very strong run stopper here, 
to me, this is a disruptive guy that's able to get in the backfield and just cause a lot of havoc. Yeah. Like you mentioned, three young quarterbacks in this division, just in this in the AFC South, that we have to try and slow down. That's not mentioning the other quarterbacks that the Titans would be facing in the AFC. A guy that can get back there, disrupt things, throw the timing off on plays is crucial. You need that type of guy out there. You need the kind of guy that has a good burst, good speed, and Broswell could help that. And I mean, we're, it looks like we're kind of on the fence on this one, especially with the grades we got now, right now. Al gives us a C plus and Lone Star is definitely not happy with this one at an F, which that's fine. I mean, I don't expect everybody to be, you know, given this an average grade at this point, but I am going to say this. There's just so little to no depth in free agency at this point with edge rusher and with defensive tackle. So this is really the road the Titans have to go on. And depending on if there's an opportunity for them to trade up, even they're going to have to give up more capital. So it's a lose, lose scenario at that point. So I just feel if Roswell's at this position, right at the point where the Titans are selecting at 38, I think it's a chance worth taking. Yeah. I understand, you know, there's concerns there about him just not having enough experience. There's concerns about, you know, just technique and just little things like that. But once again, I allude to the fact Tracy Rocker gives me comfort there. That's a good point. I mean, you, you made that point, uh, I believe, last week as well with pairing up Sweat uh, with Tracy Rocker. And, <clears throat> you know, a- everyone in the chat, obviously everyone has their opinion on it. And like... That's like fine. You, we want we want that. We exactly. Want that and, you know, given them giving their opinion, we give ours. Is Broswell my first choice at 38 no you know we we talked about the guy last week that given where this titans team is at right now i would if sweat is still there at 38 i would prefer sweat but if sweat is off the board the titans are still looking to add to their defense robinson's gone like you said, I think Broswell could be a guy worth taking a chance on at that point. And of course, this being a show for the fans, by the fans, let's hear what you guys want to say. It's your pick at 38. Who would you like to see the Titans take at 38? Because honestly, we're probably only going to have one more of these profile shows, and then we got a few cool things in the bag. So who would you like to see at 38? Lou Man jumping in real quick <laughs> with Frank Gore Jr. And... Lou, I think Frank Gore Jr. is going to have a great opportunity to be successful, but I just don't see anybody making a shot at 38, let alone in the second round for Frank Gore Jr. Now, I I think you could grab him a a lot later in the draft. Lone Star says, if we go tackle, definitely wide receiver. And I mean, I, that's the obvious one, but I mean, you know, I'd have to ask which wide receiver would you want to go with at that point? Because I feel, you know, I think Troy Franklin's all right. His size concerns me. And look, I know that worked out for Devondre Sweat. You know, it's a different offensive system, though. My biggest concern is, you know, you can't rely on guys that have that small frame playing against just, you know, athletes that are about outweighing them roughly about 20 to 30 pounds. That Jeff, that just definitely concerns me. I know Xavier Legette's another name and I don't know. To me, that's just a reach at this point. I feel he's a third round wide receiver and that's like the golden rule of drafting. You don't overreach for guys 
And I kind of feel that that might be an overreach here because I mean, I don't know if has South Carolina had their pro day yet. I haven't heard anything about it. Um, I think they did. I think they had it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I could be wrong. Definitely in the chat, let us know if South Carolina has already had their their pro day. Yeah, I mean, to me, I mean, even in the combine, it nothing he did really just stood out to me that you know got me excited about his game. You know, I know you get the AJ Brown comparisons, but that's about it. And. Mitchell says that they did have I mean, their pro day. And thanks for that, Mitchell. And I mean, look, I don't know what Rand Carthon's board looks like. Nobody does. You know, he could be sitting there within round two on that board, and that might be the way they go. But right now, especially talking to a lot of people, especially a lot of people that are really good at just analyzing the draft, they just have them in the third round mostly. So for right now, I see it as a reach. That's just me, though. And I mean, especially with the other holes the Titans still have to address, whether it be defensive line, whether it be linebacker, whether it be safety, whether it be edge rusher, all the things they have to address that aren't offensive tackle are on the defensive side of the ball. And I mean, that just goes back to the point, if we had a third round pick, I wouldn't have a problem if the Titans went wide receiver or even added another offensive tackle to the mix. But I just don't think that's what the game plan is right now. It's a sticky situation at best. I mean, I genuinely think that the Titans could, if they wanted to address the wide receiver position, I don't have a problem with it. But at the same time, you kind of have to set yourself up in the mindset this guy might be replacing DeAndre Hopkins. So I have to feel comfortable enough for him to take on that kind of responsibility. And, and that's a good point there because, you know, like you said, you're the, the way you're looking at it is the Titans are probably Titans and DeAndre Hopkins are going to have this year. And then DeAndre Hopkins is, potentially gone next year. So if you decide to take a guy at 38, then he's potentially going to be your DeAndre Hopkins replacement, or you're already looking ahead to next year's draft to see who maybe one of the top guys is and that potentially being the case. But do you want to take that chance? And here's where it gets really tricky. I mean, let's say for argument's sake, and I mean, this alludes back to the point of us making the last few weeks, but it's something we definitely bring up and everybody should be bringing up because it's a legitimate question. You know, let's say the Chargers make that move at five with the Vikings. And right after that, J.J. McCarthy goes at five. Let's say the Giants love Roma Doomsday because it's really a coin flip at this point. It's either neighbors or a Doomsday, and I'm hearing especially from one of my Giants guys, they're pretty high on a doomsday, especially with the skill set that he has and what they do offensively. So at seven, you could potentially be looking at Joe Alt and Malik Neighbors right there in the same picking radius. So what do you do then? Everybody in the chat, love to hear your opinion on that. Pick seven, who are you taking? Alt, Neighbors, Tyler? I'm giving you first crack while everybody gives their take. Man, that this is tough. It, it's tough when because what we were just talking about when you're talking about potentially having to replace uh, DeAndre Hopkins next year, you know, you could add neighbors this year and that wide receiver room then becomes deandre hopkins calvin ridley and neighbors neighbors is able to learn under deandre hopkins learn from calvin ridley as well and then 
next year, if DeAndre Hopkins is gone, you would still be set up with neighbors and Ridley ready to go. But at the same time, that left tackle position has been so bad. And quarterbacks for the Titans have had no time. Can you really risk missing out on a guy that is probably going to be a 10-year plus starter at the left tackle position. I I slightly lean towards alt, but it is a very close decision for me. I think if you can sure up your offensive line, especially that left side, then you could find another receiver later and still be okay going forward because you're giving Will Levis more time in the pocket. I mean, believe me, this scenario has popped in my head countless times on on these mock drafts where it happens certainly very frequently, especially the closer we get to the draft. But I have to stick with the original plan of why the Titans are picking this high in the first place. They couldn't protect Will Levis. They couldn't protect Ryan Tannehill, for that matter. And as you said, Tyler, you know, it's a problem that needs to be fixed immediately. I love Malik Neighbors' skill set. Malik Neighbors could be just a Pro Bowl level wide receiver, given the chance on the right system and on the right team. And I mean, Even if they did go neighbors, there is talent further down the line in the second round where if the Titans had to address tackle and they felt good about addressing tackle in the second round, okay, or that's fine. But to me, Alt, as we've said, you know, and, you know, Awakened brought this up, and this is very much the point that I'm driving home. Alt, I think, just is one of those guys that's going to be special. He comes from an athletic family. His father was an all-pro with Kansas City. The man's retired in the ring of honor. That's how much of an impact he made with the Chiefs within his 10-year career. So Malik Neighbors, to me, I wouldn't be mad if they picked him. Mm -mm. But I know right now the Titans have to address this need and fix it if they want Will Levis to be successful. We went through all that trouble last year at bringing in Peter Skaronsky. They go out in free agency, add Cushenberry, solidify the offensive line somewhere in the middle. Brunskill can do the job for now. Right tackle. It's a coin flip. You know, at this point, Nicholas Petit Friere, I'll still give him a shot because, you know, Bill Callahan's calling the shots with the offensive line. I'm comfortable with that. But guys like Alt could be a huge difference in what the Titans can be success wise. And there is receiver talent in this draft as well. But the thing is there's receiver talent in next year's draft. Not a lot, but believe me, Rand Carthon came from a team that's very aggressive, not only in free agency, but also in the draft. So if the Titans wanted to, it didn't seem out of the pitcher or even out of mind or out of character for this team to potentially make a move up in the draft to get that wide receiver if they had to move up for him. And there's a few that I'm thinking of, but I don't want to give too much away. That's another (laughs) conversation for another day. So believe me, I, I got a couple guys I'm watching some film on, and there's one guy in particular I'm willing to trade up for, but like I said, we'll sit on that for another day. But Regardless of everything going on right now, the Titans are in a great position going into the second round to add more defensive help. And I think that's the biggest key component here, excluding offensive line or wide receiver at this point. Don't think it's a bad option if they went wide receiver in the second round. But I think it's beneficial, especially for a young defensive-minded head coach that wants guys that are aggressive that are able to be disruptive, just like Broswell is. 
he can break through that offensive line, that he can get there, create turnovers. The man had a scoop and score for 28. So it's all there. It's just trying to figure out if he fits what the Titans are trying to do long term. And I think he could. And I mean, you guys brought in some major points too with that. I think you have to try and piece everything in the right direction in what you're trying to do long term. And I think the Titans are on the right track. But I do think defense needs to be the biggest focal point within this draft. So getting back to your comments before we go to our break. And I, that's a fair point, Moss, man. I mean, neighbors is a generational talent. Mm -hmm. I'm not denying that. I mean, LSU is wide receiver you right now. Let's not even deny that. <laughs> They're pumping them out like it just, you know, a factory level of just amazing talent that just continues to flop out of LSU. It just bewilders me. So... Ah, Patrick Paul, though, I don't know. He's only allowed two sacks in his two years, boss man, but I'm just really, his technique worries me. And I just say that as just somebody that just, his footwork's sloppy at times, and he just doesn't engage as long as an offensive lineman needs to with the defensive front, so... You know, there's things to correct there. I don't think they're impossible to correct, but they're very noticeable. And small things like that matter, especially in the NFL. <laughs> I mean, maybe a Coca-Cola. I'm not so sure about Pepsi. You know, Pepsi's <laughs> a little too strong for some people. Or do they make RC Cola? That might work. Area will definitely be upset over that one, so we'll see how that rolls. <laughs> I don't know. Is he in the draft? I mean, somebody that's like, you know, that included with, you know, the XF, what is it, the UFL now? Is uh, it what, I don't know what it is. I'm not even paying attention to it. I mean, good for those other players that are getting an opportunity. I'm just not... <laughs> It's nothing that I'm just getting shocked. If Marvin Harrison Jr. is there, JR, then we're having a completely different conversation. I'll tell you that much right now. I'm not going to hold my breath, though. But believe me, if that happens, like hmm. Titans Nation is going to be holding their breath for that 10 minutes. Lou Man asking for Tier Tard to come back. And I know the boss man's been big on this move, and I wouldn't have a problem with it. It just seems like I feel like Cincinnati's going to sign him. I just think they're waiting until after the draft. Like, really, a lot of these guys kind of sitting on the back burner. You're going to figure out where they're going to go after the draft's over with. Yeah, that's a no on mm. That's a no from me. That's got to be an April Fool's. I hope it's yeah. an April Fool's. That's some jokes aren't funny. <laughs> I think it was the UFL. So I don't know what they, I don't know what they keep changing it to. There's always mer you know what they merged with the USFL and the XFL. Yeah, <laughs> there's just too much going on, man. I can't keep up with it. I would, you know, we'll even take this into consideration. You know, I'm not opposed to trading back if it's reasonable. But that's another show for another day. There's just, there's too much to try and hit on that. I mean, if we start hitting like on that, I promise you, this would literally just go off the, this would go off the rails if we start talking <laughs> trades and everything. I mean, JR, we talked about this on a show, I think, what, a few weeks ago, Tyler, with Brock yeah. Bowers? Brock Bowers is kind of like our plan. He's not our plan C. He's more like our plan, I guess, G. 
Yeah. I so mean. we've we've come up with like different scenarios with the draft, and Brock Bowers is one of them, but he's way down the line. He's not extreme. He's not a Z plan, but I promise you, it's one of those deals where you're like it's intriguing if the move's right. Lone Star is definitely all for Rome. I like Rome. I just think the Giants like him more. And I think people just aren't talking about that enough. I mean, here's another fun tidbit for you before we even hit break. The Giants have been talking to Michael Penix. So take that in consideration. What if the Giants are one of those teams that decide, well, maybe we should go with one of the other quarterbacks because apparently Michael Penix has taken a meeting, took a meeting today with the Giants in New Jersey. So, yeah, think about that before your head hits the pillow. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to take a quick 30-second break, and when we come back, Ryan Tannehill has been through the ringer, but we're going to give him his roses tonight. It's time. It's well-deserved, and I don't care what everybody else in the chat said. It's time, damn it. The man put in his time, and we're going to give it to him tonight. So quick 30-second break with this very special announcement for you guys. So sit tight. We'll be right back. Watching the Power Hour with your hosts Michael Bishop and Tyler Stack. Ah, the Power Hour is on the air, live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, X, and Twitch. I'm your host Michael Bishop, and as always, thank you for joining us on this fine Monday evening. That's right, guys. Tyler and I are starting our own little podcast mm -hmm. on this upcoming Saturday night. Make sure you're there on wherever you get your platforms. And your podcast on on those platforms. God, I just twisted it up so bad. <laughs> yeah, podcast. Go listen to it this Saturday. It's going to be dope. And of course, guys, we can't have a show without you. You are the reason why the Titan Upload Network is such a major success. And trust me, it's because of you that we continue to put out this great content. You have killed it in the last few weeks. We have like crossed major barriers we cracked thirteen thousand. we're moving on to fourteen thousand quickly because of your support and everything that you've done for us so guys round of applause for you because you're the reason and don't forget as well with the draft coming up in the next few weeks we have got a lot to talk about so whether it be upload whether it be rossi whether it be us we're going to make sure you get all the information that you need and all the great stories as well, because somebody's got to do it at a high level. So might as well be us. So, but at least you keep us going. So mm -hmm. much appreciation. Well, Tyler, as we said, Ryan Tannehill, it wasn't the tenure he wanted to see end, but let's just say the man has definitely put in his time. And I think it's time that we've given him his fair due and his roses as well. Yeah, let, let's get into it. Like you said, Tannehill, ups, downs, but it's time to give him his roses for what he was able to do for this team. Exactly. So I think it's fair enough to say Tannehill did scratch some success out of this team, especially when there was uncertainty. So let's not waste another moment and give Ryan Tannehill his due owed. Tyler, I think people, when people use the term dark age, and this was mentioned in the comments this morning, and this just cracked me up. I don't know if they were talking about just the term in general or if they were referring to Ryan Tannehill within that sense. But when people take Ryan Tannehill and the dark ages, that infuriates me to no point because <laughs> obviously, number one, you don't remember 2014 and 2015. I very well do. 
And if you want to talk dark ages, yeah, the Tommy Smith era is like that one thing we don't talk about. <laughs> Very true. I, you know, I, especially over the last few years, I am not going to act like I was Ryan Tannehill's biggest fan over this past year, even, you know, completely the year before. However, I'm not going to put Tannehill and the Dark Ages in the same sentence together because with Ryan Tannehill leading the Titans offense, we definitely can't say we were in the Dark Ages. I mean, at one point, Titans fans were talking about how Ryan Tannehill was disrespected and how he was one of the top quarterbacks in the league statistically. I mean, can we take a minute and just appreciate the fact that the Titans literally were in just quarterback limbo at that point before Ryan Tannehill came along and it's no disrespect to what Marcus Mariota did. It's not. Marcus did some pretty amazing things in his tenure. His problem was the offense just never fit his style and he couldn't stay healthy. Mm -hmm. It was a mixed bag with what we got with him. So even in 2019, and we'll start at that point, there was just so much uncertainty. We knew Marcus probably wasn't, this was a make or break year for him. Tannehill comes in on a cheap trade. Honestly, we didn't know if this was even going to work out. Most people just said, uh, Tannehill's just, he's over the hill. He's played his best football. This is just, he's a backup at this point. Little did we know that just what he and Arthur Smith were doing and would do would just be a recipe for success. I mean, Tyler, did anybody realistically think that Ryan Tannehill could step in at how bad the Titans were doing and at that point just make any kind of difference? I, I, I mean, I didn't. I didn't expect it at the time. And like you said, though, he was able to come in, take over, and what him and Arthur Smith were able to do for this offense at the time with that change. I mean, it, it led to a great run and, you know, it was probably at that time, exactly what Ryan Tannehill needed for his career. And like I said, Marcus had his fair share of problems, boss, man. I'm not saying that Marcus didn't come in to make an impact. You know, he was crucial, especially when the Titans were able to break through with Mike Malarkey and to finally break that playoffs drought that they had for going on nearly almost a decade. So he's a key component there. The problem was it was just, as you said, coordinators just in and out inconsistency with Marcus's game and injuries. That's it. The crazy thing is, I mean, what did Tyler, I mean, that 2019 season, it almost seemed like a loss at that point. I mean, before Tannehill stepped in and just tried to make any kind of difference in a meaningless game at that point, most Titans fans were ready to just start looking for another quarterback at that point. Yeah, I know I was, I was screaming <laughs> at the top of my lungs for John Robinson to trade the farm to get Joe Burrow at that point. <laughs> yep. And you know, it's, it's just crazy. The turn that this team was able to take at that point. I mean, after that Denver game, like, you know, like I said, the the spark that Tannehill was able to bring to the offense with that change at the quarterback position that 
like I said, just led to a crazy run that no one expected. And I mean, it grand scheme of things, it definitely changed the outlook for this Titans team going forward for the next few years. So looking back at what Tannehill did and just his entire body of work with the Tennessee Titans for his five-year tenure. So the man threw about 90 plus touchdowns, 40 interceptions, won about 39 games, completed about almost 67% of his passes, rushed for 21 touchdowns, Styler. That's impressive. Especially for a quarterback that just you didn't think was that mobile at that point. And most of his career, even with Miami, he didn't run for anything ever. Mm -hmm. So what would you contribute a big key component to his success? Would you say it was more just the offensive planning of Arthur Smith? Or would you say it was just having Derrick Henry that helped just ease the blow on that? I mean, what's your take on the two? I, I mean, I, I've, I've done this with other things before, but I think it was a combination of both. I think it was, you know, Arthur Smith's offense. Okay, though, I, I'm going to stop you right there because <laughs> you're not going to get away that easy. Ah, I, ne- come on. I need, I need. This can't be a both. This isn't a vanilla and chocolate mixture kind of thing. I need, uh, just what do you think was the bigger difference maker? I'm going to say the the bigger difference maker was probably Derrick Henry. And I say Derrick Henry because of how well him and Ryan Tannehill were basically able to help each other out. Um, I think having a running back back there, having Derrick Henry back there, what he's able to do, the respect that he commanded from defenses, like they they were going to sell out to try and stop Henry. It was one of those things of we're going to try and stop Derrick Henry and try and make Ryan Tannehill beat us. And Tannehill was able to do that in several cases. So, and also, like you mentioned, the the 21 rushing touchdowns. You think about how many of those come off of that read option with Derrick Henry. And again, it's because the defense is was selling out to stop Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill was able to pull it and you know like we said Tana wheels he would take off and next thing you know he's doing that finger roll in the end zone so I'll give more of it more of his success of being able to kind of break out in this offense to the fact of Derrick Henry was there behind him And Bossman brings up this point, and I'll hit on it as well because I think it's a fair point. I'm fine with Jay Rob ex- that he extended him. I know Tom Brady was on the market. I don't know if he wanted to come here. Honestly, Tom Brady to me at this point, he wanted to go somewhere where I think he was going to have more control, and I don't think he was going to go that with Frable. I don't care how close we think they were. Brady wanted to do his own thing, and I think he was going to do that in – either Miami or with Tampa Bay and Tampa Bay seemed to be the one that wanted to give him what he wanted. Also, I think you have to consider these facts as well. You know, let's take into consideration Arthur Smith leaving was a big punch in the stomach. Mike Vrabel putting in Todd Downing, which was basically just a kiss of death that just slowly festered over time. The lack of an offensive line that the Titans just couldn't build properly and just the lack of talent they failed to surround him with. I mean, eventually that just starts to add up. 
I mean, I'm not going to say that that contract was a big component that helped move things along. I mean, that's a fair debate. And I mean, we can have that debate. My biggest thing is I feel there's smaller things that added up to that. And it was kind of, it was a kind of a snowball effect. I see it as just everything on top of that contract just massively built this thing up and it just finally just crashed. So, I mean, Tyler, I mean, all in all, there's a lot of key components we can take and make discussions with on what we felt just helped push Tannehill to the point of just no return. What do you think was the biggest key factor there? Uh, the biggest key factor for the point of no return with Ryan Tannehill, I personally, for me, what the biggest point of no return was, was just the, the lack of playoff success the last couple of times the Titans made it and how when it came down to it, ball was in Ryan Tannehill's hands and he had to make the play. He crumbled. And I think that was the kind of the point of no return because, you know, while they had been able to, you know, overcome some things like the uh, Todd Downing being the offensive coordinator, the offensive line struggles. They were still able to overcome some of that. And Tannehill was still able to help them win some regular season games. But I think ultimately what led to the point of no return, especially for fans with Ryan Tannehill, were those last couple of playoff games. That's a fair point. And I mean, boss man brings up another point. It wasn't a line. It was the coaching. And I agree with you on that. I just think everything else is just smaller and it just snowballed from there. You know, the Titans had no answer. The problem is they've never been able to develop offensive linemen. And, James from Titans for Life has come and talked about this with us quite frequently. And I agree with him. They've never been able to develop an offensive lineman since Mike Vrabel took over. So at that point, I think that's a failure as well. And you have to contribute that. And Tyler, I mean, as with the point, you know, Ryan Tannehill not finding success in the playoffs, I'm not arguing that as well with that point. I feel at some point you really have to be the guy to step up and lead your team. That's one of the jobs of being a quarterback and just mm -hmm. Ryan Tannehill could just never deliver that. And it's frustrating, especially with the fact that, yeah, they had Derrick Henry. They had AJ Brown. They had a good offense in 2019. that was clicking with Arthur Smith. Everything just fell apart at the seams because of just bad decisions. And I mean, we can talk to or blue in the face about that Bengals game. And the sad thing, you know, it's one of those we'll never know. We'll never know how far we could have gotten at that point. I mean, imagine if that offense, you know, continued to play the way they did in 2019 against the Chiefs in the AFC Championship game, and they had a defense that could actually stop Patrick Mahomes. Uh But here's the key factor here. Regardless of your feelings on Ryan Tannehill, and this is truth, and this will always be until numbers and time changes it, he's now the fifth all-time leading passer in Tennessee Titans history. Right above the man he replaced in Marcus Mariota. Mm. I mean, 
again, like we talked about at the start of this segment, I I can't look at how Ryan Tannehill was able to help turn this team around for a couple of years and put him and the Dark Ages in the same category, same sentence. And like you said, he's on up there for in all-time passing yards for the Tennessee Titans. He was able to do some good for us. Was it? Were there? It were there some bad times? Yes. Were there some down times? Yes. But when you look back overall at what Ryan Tannehill was able to do as a Tennessee Titan. He did help turn this team around. Because I'm here to annoy you, Walker. I know you're a Colts fan, and I'm here to annoy you. (laughs) And I'm doing my job damn well good, sir. But regardless of that, you know, taking one of my favorite Ryan Tannehill games, and I mean... I'm sure everybody has one of them and I've got to go with the Raiders game. I think that to me was the tipping point back in December of 2019. Just to, that was a dominating performance, Tyler. I mean, Mm -hmm. the man went out there, threw up 391, three touchdowns. I mean, everybody looked damn near unstoppable. And that was just, that was a great game. Yeah. That, I mean, it, it's one of those games that you kind of look at and you're like, man, if if that was the performance we could have gotten every week, just imagine where this team <laughs> would have gotten to. It I was mean, an eye op- it was an eye opening game. It basically set the stage for what the Titans could be. And as everybody in the comments said, there's a lot of factors to key in on that. Mike Vrabel's ego being a very big one of them. I mean, you know, we can debate that another day because believe me, we've got a whole off season. Maybe we'll hit on that one of these days, but I promise you <laughs> it, it was a problem. So, and to finish this thing out, of course, I definitely have to think, you know, especially with Ryan Tannehill's career wrapping up. My biggest question is, where do you think he ends up going, Tyler? Um, up until Pittsburgh traded for Justin Fields, I really thought there was a chance that Ryan Tannehill could end up there to kind of reunite with, uh, Arthur Smith. But I saw someone mention it in the chat earlier. I can't remember who it was, but I think Denver could be a landing spot as a uh you know Denver they're going to be looking for you know potentially be looking for one of these quarterbacks in the draft and maybe bring Ryan Tannehill in as that veteran backup or maybe they bring Tannehill in as the guy to start out if they're not able to maybe trade up and get the guy that they truly want to let one of these other guys, you know, learn a couple weeks behind him. But I think Denver could be a likely landing spot. Oh, the savagery is so real in the chat. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, great minds think alike. And honestly, I think Sean Payton's going to draft a younger quarterback. Bo Nick seems to be, the consensus right there, but I still feel he wants somebody with experience. So Denver feels like the right spot for him. You know, you're not asking much for him. I think Denver's kind of just in a point where they're going to find themselves in a rebuild, but they don't want to like throw a young quarterback out there. So they're going to throw Tannehill out there. He'll get the job done. He'll get you where you need to go. I think Denver's expectations are low but I think they're good enough to feel comfortable letting Ryan Tannehill run this offense. So it's a good fit. It's a good scheme fit. And I mean, Sean 
Peyton's really going to have some time to do what he really wants to do unless they decide to just go out and all out tank and try and get a quarterback for next year, which that's a thin market to say the least. But as we wrap it up, Ryan Tannehill, we thank you for all the time that you've had here. We thank you for everything that you've done. You're Titan. You're part of Titans history, whether people like it or not. Good, bad, or indifferent. And I know there's some bad, but there's some good as well. I mean, think of it this way. Ryan Tannehill basically ran, so Will Levis has the opportunity to walk now. And we'll see what Will Levis can do with his opportunity. I hope we're not talking about another quarterback down the road that basically had to just handle what he had to deal with. But, you know, maybe good things are on the horizon. I mean, Chiefs fans had to take – Chiefs hands had – Alex Smith before they got Patrick Mahomes. So think about that. True. All right, guys, we'll take a quick 30 second break. And before we get out of here, we'll shut up shop with one of our favorite segments of the night. So quick 30 second breather. And we'll be back after these. the Power Hour with your hosts, Michael Bishop and Tyler Staggs. Ah, the Power Hour is on the air, live streaming on YouTube, Facebook, X, and Twitch. I'm your host, Michael Bishop, and as always, guys, thank you for joining us on this fine Monday evening. You've been phenomenal. The comments have been phenomenal. Everything has been phenomenal. This is the kind of Monday I like that everything that you guys do that make it a great show. So before we get out of here and shut down the show, shout out to you guys. Round of applause as always. Well, Tyler, we got one more to go, so let's get to it and shut down shop for the night. You ready? Let's do it. Give me my damn theme music. Closing time. Good night, losers. Hmm. I know. I didn't want to talk about this at all. I did not want to talk about this. And believe me, you know, discount Dollar General Jesus has had enough airtime as it is. But I'm not going to let this slide. So if you may not already not know, Nick Wright apparently is still salty about Legereus Sneed coming to the Tennessee Titans, you know, for a Coke and a bag of Lay's. But I'm not the one that implemented that trade. The Chiefs did. Let's be honest. I think the Chiefs are going to be okay. I think McDuffie slides into that slot and they draft another cornerback. Chiefs are fine. However, Nick Wright, all mopey, all sad, all disingenuous, just had to get that little pot shot at the Titans, you know, Bad organization, poorly run. Yeah, the poorly run organization that just fleeced you for Legereus Sneed, that signed Calvin Ridley to a long-term deal, but yet you all continue to want to tie him to letting A.J. Brown go because apparently you don't know who the hell was the GM during that tenure. So, you know, I get you being mad. I get you fanboying out. And I mean, you kind of have to play it very carefully, especially when you're part of the national media circuit, because it just looks kind of just desperate, if you know what I mean. And I'm not saying he can't be a fan of his team. He's a grown man. He can do what he wants. I just think it's unprofessional of him to kind of just look salty at that point. I'm just simply saying, I didn't make that trade. Honestly, you should be mad at anybody. Be mad at your owner because they're cheap because they didn't want to pay him. 
be mad that apparently the Kansas City Chiefs are potentially maybe on their way out of Kansas City because they want the city to pay for the stadium themselves. But hey, that's another topic for another discussion. <laughs> I'm just saying, Nick Wright, I get your saltiness. But at the same time, I don't care. Deal with it. I had to deal with 2015 and 2014. So you can enjoy your little high winning streak. You can enjoy your Lombardi trophies. Hopefully we'll get there one day. and Maybe we can just kind of have a nice little laugh about it. But until then, you just keep being your sweet little salty self. You know, Dollar Tree Charlie Whitehurst over there. <laughs> so now that I've said my piece about that, we'll go ahead and shut this thing down, guys, by playing one of our favorite games. Bet you didn't know. It's Tyler and I ask questions about each other and let you all know just a little bit about ourselves before we get out of here. So, Tyler, I'm pretty sure I went last time, so I guess you're up next. Yeah, so the one I have for you this week, going back to your childhood, because I know there's a lot of people out there that you know, did have this growing up, but just to find out about Michael Bishop more, did you have an imaginary friend when you were younger and growing up? Oh, you're really breaking through some child childhood walls right here. <laughs> <sighs> I can't recall, but I just, you know, I'm I'm very. I guess I just had my own little world that I just, but I guess that's most everybody at that age mm. when they're younger. You know, you just you kind of just build your little world and you just live in it. I can't really recall any imaginary friend like that. So I know it seems like a cop out on my end, but I'd have to say no, because nothing, nothing comes over to mind on that. And I mean, if I did, I'd be, I'd be honest with you. Yeah. And that's the most people, if they, if they did, they remember what they call, you know, the name for their imaginary friend, what their imaginary friend looked like, all of this. So, you know, if you're not able to recall that, I don't see it as a cop out. I'll just, I'll have to go on that one and say, I just, I can't remember if I did. I was very, I was very social with people. I mean, especially once I kind of got out of my bubble. So then I just had my little click. So, you know, anybody that did have an imaginary friend as a younger kid, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. everybody copes in different ways when they're younger. Lou man wants to know what kind of push mower I like. Well, Lou, as somebody that's, you know, trying to get skinnier, I guess maybe I should think about a push mower. But I mean, honestly, <laughs> at my point, you know, I would just rather have a riding mower. Yep. <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess, you know, maybe a John Deere. I They, they seem popular. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, somebody mows our lawn. You know, my wife's brother mows lawn over here every week, so... You know, I don't have to worry about that, but it is what it is. If I could ride a mower, if I had a riding mower, I'd just use a riding mower. Lou Man says he likes the snapper version. So, Tyler, finishing up with your question, and I'm going to have to give one that's going to have to challenge your mind a little bit. Oh, fine. Right. And I might get some pushback on this one, but I ask the tough questions because that's how I roll. So, my question to you tonight: Which would you have? Which would you rather sit through if you had to? Oh, would you rather sit through the Titans losing a Super Bowl, or would you rather see the Ravens win a Super Bowl in Nashville? Ah, uh, uh... I told you I was going to throw a hardball question at you tonight. So that's just how I roll. Mm. Your screen's rather... freezing up. Your screen's freezing up, so I knew I just hit I hit all the wrong buttons on this one. 
Would I rather sit through the Titans losing the Super Bowl or watch the Ravens win one in Nashville? I am... I would rather sit through watching the Titans lose the Super Bowl because I can't stand the Ravens. Really wouldn't be able to stand seeing them win one in Nashville. And also if if I'm at if I'm be able to be at the game watching the Titans at least I'm getting to witness them play in the Super Bowl in person. See, as I, much I, as it would suck. I know, but I'm just if it's me, I'm going the opposite. I don't want to have to sit there and watch them lose again. I don't want to have to go through that. You know, I mean, my situation is different. I have family ties with family members in Baltimore. So that doesn't bother me. That's been like a rivalry between me and family members for like years. So I'm not bothered by that at all. I can live with that. But if I got to sit through the Titans losing another Super Bowl, then of course, like despair, discouragement. And it's like, how long is it going to be till we go back and the track record for teams that lose the Super Bowl? It's not very good. So I'd rather the Ravens come to Nashville and win the damn thing there than me having to sit there and watch the Titans lose it. Let me ask you this point on it, though. Do you do you already know, like you're the only one that knows it, do you already know going into that game, though, that the Titans are going to lose or that the Ravens are going to win in, in this scenario? Or are you there watching the game and however it unfolds it unfolds well if i knew i wouldn't go well no, that's, that, the that, case. no that, that's why i'm asking because in this hypothetical here you know you're you're having to pick between the two so it you know at that point all you know is that the titans have made it back to the super bowl they're there in your mind, they have a chance. I mean, your team's at a good enough point to be there versus a team that you have a history and rival with, rivalry with having to watch them win it in your house. Fine, then let them win it in the house. <laughs> I'd rather let them win the damn thing there than me have to sit there for four hours, anxiety ridden, possibly drunk, no, very <laughs> drunk, and then just go home feeling deflated and defeated. And then, like, not only is my next three to four weeks ruined, I've got to come back on this show and talk about it. <laughs> How am I going to sell that? I can't sell anything positive off that. I can't spin that. <laughs> At least if the Ravens win, I can just be like, okay, that's fine. It's like I said, that doesn't bother me that much. I have family members that have Baltimore ties. We've rooted against each other. It's fine. I don't have a problem. Hell, they're happy they got Derrick Henry. I just said, take care of my boy. <laughs> Just take care of them. That's all you got to do. But I cannot, for the life of me, sit for four hours, lose the Super Bowl, and then spend the rest of the offseason just trying to discuss that. Because that's all we're going to talk about on this show. That's all we're going to talk about on this network. Then we're going to come up with a big question. Are they ever going to win the big one? It's like, oh, it's now two. What if the Titans lose three in a row? What if they lose four in a row? Then we're getting into Bill's territory. Bill's fans look like they're enjoying life. They're miserable. <laughs> let's be honest. And that's not a knock on any Bill's fans, but let's be honest. Bill's fans, they're the type that just really just try and smile and pretend everything's okay. 
It is not. I, I do. I want to throw this back out at you right quick, just for a final point from me, though. Right now, though, how you mentioned that if they went to another one, lost, we'd be having to talk about, man, if they make it to another one, are they going to lose three? Are they going to lose four? But right now, we're sitting here wondering, will this team ever make it back to a Super Bowl to even have a chance at it? And that's my point. <laughs> the whole demographic of teams that lose in the Super Bowl, it does not bode well for them. The 49ers have been the lucky ones, and they've got a good front office, and they've got the right head coach and the right pieces in place. So they've got a window. The 49ers, I think, should very well easily still be the favorite in the NFC. But it eventually closes because people want to get paid. People want better opportunities. And then, of course, if things aren't working, things change. So I'd much rather see a team that I, I'm not a fan of. Let me put it to you this way. Now, I'm fine with the Ravens. They are what they are. They don't bother me as much as some people do. But I'll put it to you this way. If it's the Rams in there, oh, hell no. <laughs> no. No. -mm. Mm -mm. No. No. I can't even look at Kurt Warner and Marshall Falk. I can't. Mm. Jay, I'd love a rematch too. We almost had one. We almost had one if we won that damn playoff game. It would have been us playing them in their house. You want to know how wonderful that would have been to humiliate them in Los Angeles? Would have been great. That would have made my year. But here we are talking about what ifs. I don't know, guys. I'm, just, I'm optimistic. I've seen crazy things in sports, and they're amazing to behold. And I'm hoping and I'm holding out hope that one day we get to talk about winning a Super Bowl on this network. You know, nothing would bring me greater joy with my tenure being here. I would love to see Tyler's reaction. I would love to see Rossi's reaction. Upload would probably be dropping shorts and everything for maybe about two months straight. <laughs> you can fact check me on that. He'll do it. But at some point, it's just... I would love to see a team succeed and just grab hold of that window of opportunity when they have it. I mean, I've already got a run in theory. The Titans will be back right on top of things in 2028. I mean, they had a great team in 2008. They had a really great team in 2020. So every time they celebrate a anniversary with a zero in the end of it, works out pretty well for them. Not so much the five ones. As you can see, the 15th anniversary didn't go so well. 25th didn't go so well. But you look at the 10th anniversary and the 20th anniversary. Yeah, those those were good. So I'm holding out hope for the 30th. <laughs> uh, but anyway, guys, thank you for joining us on the Power Hour tonight. You guys have been phenomenal. The comments have been phenomenal. You hung around and stuck it out with us. So thank you so much. Round of applause for you guys. And don't forget to follow and subscribe to the Titan Upload Network and all of our content pages. And of course, all our content creators, whether it be Upload, Rossi, or myself, and of course, Tyler. We're going to give you what you need every week whether it comes to Titans-related or NFL-related news. Upload's talking about doing wrestling. I mean, you know, more power to them. You know, there's, a big, there's a big wrestling fan base out there, so why not? You know, jump out and expand your wings. I think that'd be cool. But, you know, maybe we'll do a poll on that. Maybe you'll do a poll. So make sure you subscribe. And don't forget, guys, 
Big news tomorrow night, AFC Roundtable. I will be in Rossi's place tomorrow night, so check that out at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Big exclusive right there. So check out the AFC Roundtable. We will be having a good show at 7 p.m. Eastern time, so I'll be filling in for Rossi. Really great show as well. And as once again, Tyler and I will be dropping our podcast this Saturday. Check it out. I think maybe about... We'll have it out about maybe 10 o'clock. So keep your eye on that wherever you get your podcast at the BS report. Really excited about that. So Hmm. check it out. It'll be a good time. All right, guys, we're out of here. We'll see you next Monday. The draft is coming sooner than you think. So we're going to get you ready regardless. So for Tyler Staggs, I'm Michael Bishop of the Power Hour. And as always, guys, take care and tighten up. Tighten up. You're watching the Titan Upload Network.